title of the sermon, church, is called The Coming Storm. The Coming Storm. Now, uh, this particular story that we're going to share with you today is actually found in two different places in the Bible. Uh, the first place is found in 2 Kings, and then we'll also be going to 2 Chronicles. Now, I'll be referring to scriptures, but I will not read every single scripture because we simply don't have time to read every single one. But I'll read enough so that you can understand exactly what's happening uh, in the story, because this story, you will see, will parallel what God's people will go through in the last days. It's amazing how the Bible tends to repeat itself over and over again because God is seeking to make a point for his people. Because God wants us to be ready for the crisis that is coming upon this world. We know there's a crisis coming. And it's one thing to, to read about the crisis and to understand it's coming, but it's something else to be ready for the crisis, isn't it, isn't it church? So let's delve into this story and see what is it that God wants us to learn today. We just heard the scripture that was read by Sean. And the Bible tells us that King Hezekiah now begins to reign in Judah. And he is 25 years old when he begins to reign. The Bible says, and we're in 2 Kings right now, 18. The Bible says that he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. That's a good thing, isn't it? Yeah. And the Bible says that he trusted in the Lord God of Israel. Another beautiful thing. And in verse 6 it says that he clave to the Lord and departed not from following him, but kept his commandments which the Lord commanded Moses. So we learn that King Hezekiah was a man of God, who he was obedient to God, he followed God, and he did whatever God told him to do. And we see in verse 7, it says that the Lord was with him, and he prospered whithersoever he went. But then we get to the last part of that verse 7. And this is really where this story begins. This is really where the, the crisis for the king Hezekiah begins in Judah. And the last part of that verse 7 says, And he rebelled against the king of Assyria and served him not. The king of Assyria, his name was Sennacherib, and he was a godless and ruthless king. And that's why Hezekiah refused to serve him. And because Hezekiah refused to serve King Sennacherib of Assyria, he became furious, and here's what he did. Now I want you, as I said before, that this story is told in two different areas of the Bible. So I, now I want you to turn with me to Second Chronicles. We're going to go back and forth here and there. Second Chronicles chapter 32. And I want you to see what King Sennacherib did because of Hezekiah's rebellion. Hezekiah refused to serve him. So let me know when you get there. Let me go, let me know when you get there. Second Chronicles 32. We're going to look at verse 1. And you're there? Yeah. All right. So it says, now after these things and the establishment thereof, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came and he entered into Judah and he encamped against the fenced cities and thought to win them for himself. So King Sennacherib is upset that King Hezekiah has refused to serve him. So now he is determined to go take Judah. So what he does is he encamps around the cities of Judah. Now I need to tell you something about Assyria, the, this Assyrian army. It was one incredible army. So you need to understand exactly what Judah and King Hezekiah what they were going up against. Again, all of this, you will see, has so much relevance for God's people in the last days. Let me tell you about this army, church. It was well-organized and professional. They were a fighting force unlike any other force during their time. 
They, this force was divided into infantry, cavalry, chariots, and archers. The soldiers were well trained and specialized in different kinds of combat. This army church was large and diverse. They drew troops from all across the country. They were known for their specialized fighting skills and knowledge of different terrains. One of the most feared aspects of the Assyrian army was its expertise in siege warfare. They used battling rams and siege towers and ramps that breached city walls. They were known for building extensive siege works around to isolate the cities, an incredible army. They were known for their brutality in psychological warfare. The Syrians were known for this. They used psychological warfare to terrorize their enemies, often displaying the bodies of their defeated foes in gruesome ways or deporting large populations. This fearsome reputation often caused city just simply to surrender without even a fight. They were known to be the first, one of the first armies to utilize iron weapons, which gave them an advantage over every other army that used bronze weapons. They were equipped with iron-tipped spears and swords and arrows. Their soldiers wore iron helmets and scale armor and carried large shields for protection. The Assyrians made extensive use of chariots. So they were heavily armed church and they were used for shot effect in battle. They developed a formidable cavalry force which provided mobility and flexibility in warfare, allowing them to quickly attack and subdue their enemies. In addition to military strength, they were skilled engineers. They built roads and bridges to move their troops, their troops efficiently. They dug canals and diverted rivers to undermine enemy forces during sieges. And lastly, they never lost a war. Wow. Never. They were a formidable army, and now this army surrounded Judah. This was church a David and Goliath scenario, and it did not appear that Judah and King Hezekiah had any chance here. But initially, we see that King Hezekiah was not afraid. In fact, since the wise and spirit of prophecy tells us that, that King Hezekiah now, now that the city of Judah, there were various cities around Judah, now that they were surrounded by this Assyrian army, and now King Hezekiah begins to, she says, prepare for the coming storm. So I want you to turn with me. You're already in 2 Chronicles. And we're going to look at verse 32. We're going to start at verse 8. But we're going to, we already read uh, some of this. But we want you to see exactly what he did to prepare for war. See, it's important that you understand that the king prepared for the war. But you're later going to see what effect this preparation had on the war. This is so relevant for God's people in the last days. So in 2 Chronicles 32... I'm going to go right over there because I want you to see some of what he did to prepare for this war. Because God does not expect us just to sit and do nothing, does he? Amen. God expects us to do what we must. Sometimes, though, we believe that physical preparation is all that is needed to get through a crisis. You will see from the story that it's much, so much more deeper than that. I want you to get an idea of the preparations that the king took to prepare for the king of Assyria. So we're going to start at verse 1. Is after he, he had camped around the fence city. This is what uh, Sennacherib did. When Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib was come, that he was, reading verse 2, 
He was purposed to fight that this Nacarab was purposed to fight against Jerusalem. In verse 3, he took counsel with his principles and his mighty man to stop the waters of the fountains which were without the city, and they did help him. He's beginning now, church, to prepare for war. In verse 4, so there was gathered much people together who stopped all the fountains in the brook that ran through the midst of the land. Now, I'm not going to read the rest of this. I'm just going to tell you what he did to save us some time here. He manufactured weapons and shields. He appointed church military officers over the people. He did everything he knew to prepare for this war. In fact, this story is told in Prophets and Kings chapter 30. And the spirit of prophecy tells us that King Hezekiah left nothing undone in preparing for this crisis, this war. He left nothing undone. He was fully, fully, physically prepared for this war. And in verse 8, we see what he said to his men. With him, he said, is an arm of flesh. Oh, it makes so much sense. This is, this is the king of Assyria. He's talking about the king of Assyria. He's an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to what? Fight. To fight our battles. And the people, the verse says, rested themselves upon the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. So when he said those words, they were perfectly content. No need to worry. God is with us. The king of Assyria, armor flesh. But we've got God on our side. And the people were calm and confident, and they rested on those words. Now, one of the reasons why they could have confidence in those words is because church of the promise that was made to Judah. I want you to turn with me to Isaiah so you can see the promise for yourself. When God makes a promise, he keeps his promise. And as long as his people can remember the promise, they can get through anything. It doesn't matter what happens, as long as you have the promise, and as long as you can hold on to the promise, it doesn't matter what crisis comes in your life, because you have the promise. So let's take a look at this promise found in Isaiah 25 through 27. This is the promise with regards to the Assyrian army. Are you there? Isaiah 14, Isaiah 14, 25 through 27. Isaiah 14, 25 through 27. We're just laying the groundwork here, church, but you got to get this background. you got to see what's happening here. This is the promise. This is why Hezekiah could say so confidently that God is with you. This is why the people could rest so assuredly and not worry about this incredible army that surrounded the city. This is why. Here's what God promised. I will break the Assyrian in my land and upon my mountains and tread him underfoot. Then shall his yoke depart from off them and his burden depart from off their shoulders. Verse 26. This is the purpose that is purposed upon the whole earth. And this is the hand that is stretched out upon all the nations. Verse 27, for the Lord of hosts has purposed, and who shall disannul it? And his hand is stretched out, and who shall turn it back? With a promise like that, what reason was there to fear? So King Hezekiah Church did not fear. And Judah did not fear. They made their preparations. They depended on the hand of God and there was no concern and there was no worry. Just as it should be for the people of God. So the preparations now have been made and now church, the crisis comes. It's one thing to talk about a crisis is another thing to get through the crisis. You see, character is not built during a crisis. You know that. It's the crisis that determines the character that has been built. Amen. So now we're going to see what kind of character has the king built for the crisis. 
It appears that he's ready. It appears that certainly God is with him. And it appears that he is trusting in God. But now the crisis comes, and now we need to see how does he respond to the crisis. Because what we know for a fact is that there is a storm coming for the people of God, isn't there? And right now we are preparing for the crisis. But as you sit here today, you have no idea how you're going to fare during that crisis. You have no idea. For until the crisis come, you don't know what kind of character you have built. Amen. Let's see what kind of character King Hezekiah has built. I, wanna, I want to show you what happened here. Turn with me to 2 Kings. Let's go back there. I'll wait for you to get there because I want you to see this. The crisis, church, is about to begin. It's about to begin. And we're going to show you how King Hezekiah responds to this crisis. 2 Kings, 2 Kings 18, it's the uh, same chapter that, that Sean read, read out of. You're there? 2 Kings, I hear pages turning. I need you to get there. 2 Kings 18. I just told you about the Syrian army, how incredibly formidable they were, never lost the war, advanced warfare, a feared and fierce fighting machine. And here's what happened. Israel, Judah, Hezekiah has put their confidence fully in God. They have no fear. They are ready for this crisis. And here's what happened in 2 Kings 18, verse 13. In the 14th year of King Hezekiah, did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came against how many cities, church? All. All the fenced cities of Judah. And what did he do? He took them. He took them. And the only city that was left was Jerusalem. Now, wait a minute now. King Hezekiah has just told his men, his army, that God is with him. And just like that, all the cities, gone. Every last one of them, gone. King Hezekiah, he knew, he knew it wouldn't be easy. But he didn't expect the church to be this bad. All the cities gone, just like that. Where was God? Where was God? Where was all the confidence I put in God? You allow this Goliath to come in here. I've done all these preparations. And just in a matter of, of minutes, all my cities are gone. Where was God? See, this is, this is, this is where the test is. When, when something happens in your life that you don't expect, when you've made your preparations and you expect something to happen and it happens like this, when, it, when it's much worse than you anticipate. And we will see that the, the storm coming upon God's church in the last days is going to be much worse than we anticipate. And the question is, will God's people remain faithful? Will we hold fast to the truth? Or will we waver and begin to doubt God? What did Hezekiah do here? When he saw that the king of Assyria took the cities so quickly, church, he begins to doubt. And fear begins to take over. Now, mind you, once we begin to doubt, that's when Satan is able to move in. And it goes downhill from there. King Hezekiah then begins to seek help from the king of Egypt. Now, in order to find that, you have to read through several verses. So I'm just going to give you one verse. And it just gives you a hint of this. Because what happened was... The king of Assyria eventually sends these representatives to speak with King Hezekiah, and they make reference to this. So I'm going to give you the reference. Eventually sends these representatives to speak with King Hezekiah, 
don't know. He made a reference to this, so I'm going to. I don't know. Sure. Sure. I don't see the representatives. I guess the devil doesn't want you all to hear this. But okay. well, we're going to get this under control. Amen. Because there's no way that I should be repeated in that speaker. That's not even connected to that one. All right, so let's get back to it here. All right, so I want to give you this reference. And turn, we're already in 2 Kings 18. Turn to verse 24. And that's just a reference now. There's no context there, so you'll be confused by it without the context. I'll give you the context later, but I want you to see that that verse does. It makes reference. See the reference to Egypt in the verse. You see that? You see how they make reference to Egypt? Now those are King Sennacherib's representatives talking to the representatives of Hezekiah, and they're telling him, you sought help from Egypt. All right? That's found in 2 Kings 18 and verse 24, and that just makes reference to Egypt. And the Spirit of Prophecy tells us in, in chapter 30 of Prophets and Kings that King Hezekiah sought help from Egypt. Now, the reason that's important is because, remember, this was a king that had total confidence in God. And Egypt is symbolic of what, church? What is e Egypt symbolic of? Sin. That's right, a sin of the world. So understand what's happening here. See, everything that God puts in the Bible is for a reason. It is symbolic, and God is trying to tell us something here. So when it got hot and heavy, when the crisis comes, and Hezekiah begins to fear and get nervous, one of the first things he does is seek help from Egypt. See, that's what God's people at times tend to do. But let me tell you what God says about seeking help from Egypt. Turn with me. Turn with me to Isaiah 31. Isaiah 31. You see, when we get into a crisis, when it seems like all things are lost, we have a tendency to think perhaps the world can help us. Perhaps we'll turn to the world. Perhaps there's some way I can get out of this bind. Instead of turning to God. But God has a message for us today. Because when the crisis comes upon us in the last days, we will have a tendency to attempt to turn to Egypt for help. And God says, no, that's not where your help comes from. Isaiah 31, are you there, church? Amen. Verse one, it says, woe to them that go down to where, church? Egypt, Egypt for help. It's talk, symbolically talking about the world. You can't find help in the world and stay on horses and trust in what? Chariots, Chariots because they are many. Because they have all the resources, you're going to trust in them. And in the horsemen, because they are very strong, at least they seem that way. But they look not unto, who church? The Holy, the Holy One of Israel. Neither seek the Lord. Egypt cannot help you. Egypt cannot help you. This is what God wants us to understand. Because we will have a tendency when the crisis comes to turn to Egypt for help in some way. And God is telling you now, when the crisis comes, don't turn to Egypt. Egypt can't help you. Turn to me. Amen. That's what God says. But see, King Hezekiah, he turns to Egypt. But what happens here is that the king of Assyria blocks the road so that Egypt cannot help King Hezekiah. Perhaps divine providence. God doesn't want Hezekiah to seek the help of Egypt. But you see, Hezekiah is desperate. And so he turns to Egypt. But guess what? When the road is blocked, now Egypt can't help Judah and King Hezekiah. As I said, church, when doubt begins to set in, that's when the devil gets busy. And he tries to drive you to make decisions that you would never make under circumstances in which you trusted the Lord. So understand this, it doesn't stop with the king of Egypt. Now he does something that anybody in their right mind will see as completely foolish. And I want you to see it. Second Kings 18 
verse 14. 2 Kings 18 and verse 14. I'm going to read it for you. Then I'm going to explain to you what's happening here. 2 Kings 18 verse 14. And Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria to Lachish, saying, I have offended. Return from me that which thou putteth on me will I bear. And the king of Assyria appointed unto Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. So you'll have to read through that to understand what's happening, but I'm going to tell you what's happening here. Hezekiah apologizes to the king of Assyria, this God, the king, if he has offended him. And then he says to him, I will pay whatever you want to pay for you to leave me alone. Just tell me what you want. This is a king. Remember what the Bible says that he trusted in the Lord and God prospered him. But now he tells the king, uh, what will it take for you to leave us alone? So the king tells him 11 tons of silver and one ton of gold. That's equivalent to $70 million today. And it gets worse, church. It gets worse. Watch what King Hezekiah does in order to come up with the gold and the silver to give to King Snagarab. Verses 15 and 16, 2 Kings 18. Here's what he does. And Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found where, church? In the house of the Lord. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? And in the treasures of the king's house. Verse 16. At that time, did Hezekiah cut off the what? Gold, Gold from what church? Gold. You're not serious. You're not serious. He cut off the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord. And from the pillars which Hezekiah, king of Judah, had overlaid and gave it to who? Shocking, isn't it? It's almost unimaginable that you would think that a man of God would get that low. Character is not built during a crisis. The crisis reveals the character that has been built. And when you read those first few verses about King Hezekiah, you saw that he was a man of God. You saw it. You saw that the Lord prospered, and you saw the Bible says that he trusted God. But what is happening right here? What is happening during this crisis? The character is being revealed. Why do you think God has this story here? Why do you, this king knew that God was with him. He knew it. But now he's doing what, what you would call completely foolish. When we begin to doubt God's promises, we begin to do foolish things. Amen. And Satan then begins to move in. And now we begin to see the character that King Hezekiah has built. But it gets worse. Now the devil begins to move in. Now understand who is behind all of this. The king of Assyria, Sennacherib, is a ruthless and a godless king. So we know that the devil is behind him. And the devil is leading him. And the devil is inspiring him. So this is the devil attacking God's king. Get that straight. The devil is seeking to destroy God's people. So what happens here? King Hezekiah now, church. Oh, but let me go back. By the way, when King Hezekiah gave the king of Assyria all this gold, 
and silver. And he took the gold, because the deal was, if you take my gold and my silver, you back off. But guess what he did? He took the gold and his silver, and he didn't back off. Because you can't trust the devil. You can't make a deal with the devil. You would think that King Hezekiah would have known that. But you see, when the crisis comes and doubt begins to come in, you begin to think irrationally from a spiritual point of view. And this is when the devil begins to move in. See, if we can't claim the promise, then God can't help us. Because if we don't claim the promise, then we begin to do foolish things. And God needs his people to claim the promise. God has already told his people that he would be with us to the end of time. Isn't that the promise? Either you believe the promise or you don't believe the promise. Because if you don't believe the promise, then the devil is going to move in. And this is what we see happening to King Hezekiah. He is already in a fragile spiritual state. He has lost cities, church. And now King Sennacherib believes that he has King Hezekiah exactly where he wants him. This is where Satan begins to put salt on a wound. Satan doesn't want to just simply put you in distress. He's trying to take you out. So now King Snacherab engages, begins to engage church in psychological warfare. Psychological warfare. I want you to see how the devil works because this is exactly what the devil will try to do to God's people as the crisis begins to come. He will make you believe that it's over for you, that hope is gone, and you need to turn to Egypt for help. That's what he wants you to believe. But you must cling to the promise because it is the only thing that will get God's people through in the last days. So let me, but this story is here. So that you can see how the devil will work in the last days against God's people. So now the king begins to engage in psychological warfare. So let me lay the scene for you because I can read the verses and you won't quite get the story because you have to read the verses multiple times. Then you have to go back over to Kings and read the story again. So I'm going to just relay it to you for time purposes so, so you can understand what's happening. And by the way, what I'm going to explain to you is found in 2 Kings verses 17 and 18. And what you will see there is that King Sennacherib, he sent representatives to King Hezekiah. And we're going to take a brief look at what, what they said. And I want you to look at, we're going to 2 Kings 18. We're going to take a brief look here to get, get you an idea of what's going on here. Now the representatives have been sent. And when you see in 19, you see the representatives of King Sennacherib, Rabshakeh, said unto them, and they're speaking unto the representatives of King Hezekiah. Speak ye now to Hezekiah, thus saith the great king. This is what the representative is conveying to Hezekiah, the king of Assyria. What confidence is there wherein thou trustest? So what's he saying here? He's saying, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. What kind of confidence do you have in your army? Do you see what's surrounding you? How can you have any confidence in your army? In verse, verse 24, skip down there. How then wilt thou turn away the face of one captain of the least of our master's captain? In other words, you don't stand a chance. Do you know what we've done? Do you know how many armies we have defeated? You don't have a chance against us. Again, he's engaging in this psychological warfare. See, King Hezekiah is already a defeated king in that sense. He's fearful, he's in doubt, and now the devil is moving in. Because what the Assyrians hope for is they don't want to fight you, they just want to, you to surrender without a fight. See, the advantage was that they never wanted to destroy the cities, they wanted to keep the goods. So if they can get you to surrender without fighting, then that was a win for them. So now the devil is engaging in psychological warfare against the king 
and Judah. And he's trying to tell them, look, look around you. Look around you. You see this army that has never lost a war? Do you actually believe, King, that you have a chance? <laughs> Do you actually believe that? You don't have a chance, man. We've never lost a war. Preparing for the storm. We are preparing for the coming storm. And what we see right now is a storm. And King Hezekiah and Judah are in a storm. And somehow, some way, they've got to get out of the storm. I want you to look at verse 25. The devil's pouring salt on this wound now, church. Verse 25, 2 Kings 18, verse 25. And I now come up without the Lord against this place to destroy it. Listen to this. The Lord, this is the king of Assyria saying this. The Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. Now, you, would, you might think that sounds foolish for the king to say that and for Hezekiah to believe it. But here's the fact. Here's what the king of Assyria knew for a fact. The king of Assyria knew that God had used him to attack his own people previous to this. That's what he knew. So now he's reversing psychology on the king of Hezekiah, king Hezekiah and he's telling, wait a minute, now. you know, King Hezekiah, that God has used me to defeat you guys before. And that was a fact. So now Hezekiah, perhaps now, church, is beginning to think, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. 46 of my cities are already gone. Maybe what he's telling me is correct. Maybe God has sent this king. There was only one thing that would keep the king from believing that statement, and that was the promise. The promise, church. No matter what, we have to cling to the promise. No matter what we hear, we have to cling to the promise. No matter what logic tells you, that you have no place to turn, you have to cling to the promise or you will fail. And it gets worse. It gets worse. And Satan now is trying to get into his head. Again, he's not trying to just put him in distress. He's trying to destroy him. This is what he plans and wants to do with God's people in these last days. Satan wants church to get into your head. He wants you to forget about the promise. Once you forget about the promise and doubt sets in, that's when he believes he has you. I want you to take a look at what happens next. You'll find it in verse 26. I'm going to read the verse. And then I'm going to explain it to you so you understand exactly what is happening in this verse. Then said Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and Shebna, and Joah, unto Rashekah, speak, I pray thee to thy servants. Now, these are the representatives of King Hezekiah speaking to the representatives of King Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, just so you understand this. And you won't remember the names, but the point is, I want you to understand what they ask the representatives of King of, king of Assyria to do. Here's what Hezekiah's representatives ask the king's representatives to do. I pray thee to thy servants. Speak, I pray thee, to thy servants in the Assyrian language. For we understand it. And talk not with us in the Jewish language, in the ears of the people that are on the wall. Now you might be wondering, what are they asking? I'm going to explain to you what they're asking. Hezekiah's representatives are asking the king of Assyria's representatives to speak in another language so the people can understand what they're saying. Because they're concerned that if the people hear what King Sennacherib's representatives are saying, they're going to be fearful. So they say to the enemy, uh, excuse me, could you speak to us 
in another language. Because see, we don't want our people, we don't want our people to hear what you're saying. Because see, if our people hear what you're saying, they're gonna become afraid. Now, that is a foolish thing to ask. And I'm gonna show you why. And I, I hope you understand, do you understand the point we just made here? That they asked the king's representatives to speak to them in a different language so Judah can't hear what they're saying because they don't want Judah to be afraid. So, out of the kindness of the heart, I want to show you what they decided to do when they asked that favor. Turn with me to verse 28. Now, Rabshakeh, he's the king of Assyria's representative. Here's what they did when Hezekiah's representative asked them to speak in a different language. Not only did they not speak in a different language, church, but what did they do in verse 28? They cried with a loud voice in what language? The Jewish language, the people's language, saying, hear the words of the great king of Assyria. Not only did they not change the language, but they stayed in the Jewish language and they began to shout because now they said, okay, you give us an idea. You don't want us to make the people afraid? <laughs> oh, we're gonna make them afraid yeah. now. So you can't, you can't make a deal with the devil. You see how foolish that God's people can be when we begin to doubt. You see how foolish, how foolish it is to ask them to ask the devil not to, to, to shout, not to speak in the people's language so the people won't be afraid, which is exactly what they did. This is what happens when you let go of the promise. You begin to think foolishly, and you begin to act foolishly, and you find yourself in a place you never thought you would be. So no, they didn't do them a favor, church. They began to yell out loud, and you can, you can be assured, it put the people in fear. And in verse 33 and 34, now they're shouting out to the people. And they say, one of the last things they say is that, by the way, Judah, we've never lost a war. Never lost a war. Now, what do you think that did to them? Oh, yes. It's over. That's what the people are thinking. And it doesn't stop there. See, when the devil thinks he has you, where he wants you, he wants to grind you down to nothing. And that's what he's doing right now. He's trying to grind King Hezekiah in Judah down to nothing. So you need to understand the crisis that God's people will face, what we will go up against, it will be formidable. It will be impossible to survive on your own. You will need divine intervention because the devil will attempt to grind us down. And here's the last thing he says. I want you, I want you to notice this. First of all, I'm going I'm to reference it, and you won't know what it means until I explain it to you. In verse 34, he makes a reference. The last part of the verse, in verse 34, 2 Kings 18, 34, he makes a reference to Samaria. Have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Now, that's the king of Assyria saying that. Now why is that significant? Why is that significant? Because the Sumerians claimed to worship God. They claimed to be a godly people and the king of Assyria defeated him. So they're trying to convey to Judah, but listen, we have a people that were just like you, man. The Samaritans. They serve God just like you. They were just like you. They serve God. They trusted God. And guess what? We took them out. So now, because the king is in doubt, now Judah is in doubt. And all appears lost. Appears lost. Here's the, the beautiful thing about all this warfare and all this stress and all this difficulty that the king finds himself in right now. 
You might think that this is a very bad situation. I, I'll be the first to tell you, it certainly appears that way. But do you know up to this point, and when we tell the rest of the story, there is no evidence that not a single life was lost among the people of Judah. Not a single life. Amen. So right now, Judah and King Hezekiah are in deep grief and nothing has happened to them physically. The only thing that has happened is their material possessions, their cities have been taken. That's the only thing that's happened. Their life is still preserved. I want you to think about that. They are not hungry. They are not thirsty. They're in need of nothing right now, but they are in grief and in stress. Exactly where Satan wants them. And you will see that in the last days, God's people will be in the exact same state. Alive, not hungry, because God will provide your bread and water, but tempted to doubt God's providence. And that's where King Hezekiah is right now. Let's see what happened. He is stricken, we see in verse 37. He is stricken with grief. Stricken with grief. And all we have to do, church, is to look at the facts. Look at the facts. King Sennacherib has already taken 49 cities, 46 cities, all of them. All the cities he's taken. He has surrounded Jerusalem. Jerusalem is only left. That's it. The king of Assyria has never lost a war. That's a fact. Judah is greatly outnumbered. And King Sennacherib has already defeated, defeated a kingdom that has claimed to worship God. I mean, what more? How, how bad could it get? Why would Judah be any different? You're going to find out in a minute why. Why? To the naked eye, church, this appears over. Might as call the day. Put up the white flag and surrender. Perhaps that's what Satan is trying to convince King Hezekiah and Judah to do. Just, just surrender. King Hezekiah then begins to understand where he came from. And, and he begins to understand where God put him and where God has brought him from. Here's what he does now. Turn with me to 2 Kings 19. Now the man begins, church, to come to his senses. It's not too late. Okay? Amen. Now, he could have surrendered when all hope was gone. He could have said, it's over. I'm going to put up the white flag. It's over. We are lost. This war is done. Let's surrender now so we can preserve our life. He could have done that. I want to show you what he did. 19, verse 5. So the servants of Hezekiah came to who? Isaiah. That's the prophet now. And listen to this. And Isaiah said unto them, watch, listen carefully, listen carefully. Thus shall ye say to your master. Tell the king this. Thus saith the Lord, be not afraid of what? Did you catch that? Don't be afraid of the words. We used to have a saying growing up, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Many of men have been defeated with words alone. Words alone can defeat you. Satan will use words against God's people in the last days. 
and some of us will be defeated by words alone. We see here the devil engaging in psychological warfare against the people of God. And Isaiah says, wait a minute now, now you've come to the right place. And the first thing I need to tell you is, don't pay any attention to what they say. Let's get your head straight, King. You've been listening and buying this foolishness for too long. You got caught up in the words and you began to believe that perhaps you had no chance. But first thing I need to tell you is don't be afraid of the words that you've heard. Now you're going to hear some words in this crisis that's coming upon this world. You're going to hear some words. God says, don't be afraid of the words. In verse 7, God says this. Behold, I will send a blast upon him. You know what that blast means in the Hebrew? It means Holy Spirit. God says, I'm going to sick the Holy Spirit up. He's not going to have a chance. This is what God is telling the, the representative to convey to King Hezekiah. Sennacherib is not done yet, church. He's not that he's not done yet. So now he puts everything that he had said to Hezekiah in the past, he puts it all in a letter. A nice letter. A nice official letter. He wants Hezekiah now to read it. So he can see that this thing is over. It's over, King. I want you to read this letter and understand and decide that this thing is over. See, that's what the devil wants you to believe, that it's over. So he, King Hezekiah now, church, he gets this letter. And in 2 Kings 19, 14, I want you to show you what he did with this letter. And Hezekiah received the letter of the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up into the house of the Lord. And what did he do? What did he do? He spread it. He spread the letter before the Lord. That means he displayed it. This is what God expects his people to do. You got problems. You got issues in your life. You got to take those problems. You got to take those issues. You got to spread them before the Lord. Amen. That's what you have to do. Amen. That's what God expects you to do. Sister White says that this was the greatest crisis ever faced by Judah. Now, if you're sleeping, I want you to wake up. I want you to wake up now. Because what ha what's going to happen now ought to be an incredible encouragement to everyone sitting in this church. Because see, church, Hezekiah has only one weapon of war left. Just one. But it is the greatest weapon ever possessed by a child of God. And he almost forgot that he had it. What a weapon. Turn with me to Second Chronicles. So wake up if you're sleeping. Turn with me to Second Chronicles because you need to see the one weapon of war that was left, that Hezekiah forgot about. And now he finds this weapon once again. And I want you to see it because it is the most powerful weapon that a child of God has during a crisis. St. Chronicles 32 and verse 20. And for this cause, Hezekiah the king and the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, what did he do? What did he do? He did what, church? He prayed and he cried to heaven. Now he could have done that. He could have done that a few weeks ago. He could have done that previously. But he remembers about this weapon, this incredible weapon. Let me read to you a statement about this weapon this weapon called prayer. Let me read to you a statement about this weapon called prayer. It 
we have an advocate at the throne of God. And whatever we need, if we ask in faith, he will give it to us. Listen to this. We have an infinite power at our command. We may see our case as seemingly hopeless. See, somebody here might, might be feeling hopeless. You may think your case is hopeless, but here's what she says. But if we exercise faith in God, we shall be helped in the very time of need. Amen. And church is not too late. Here, it wasn't too late for King Hezekiah. He had experienced all this difficult warfare and the stress of being surrounded by the massive Assyrian army. But he remembers this weapon, this all-powerful weapon that every child of God has. It's a weapon that cannot lose a war. And here's what happens as a result of the use of that weapon called prayer. Turn with me to 2 Kings 19. Back to 2 Kings 19. I want to show you how quickly God took care of this problem. 2 Kings 19 and verse 35. And it came to pass that night, that's significant, I'll tell you that in a minute, that the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the what? The Syrians, a hundred, fourscore, and five thousand. Listen carefully. And when they arose in the morning, behold, they were all what? One angel. One angel. Now, it's not insignificant that they did this at night. Because the scripture says that weeping may endure for night. But what? Joy cometh in the morning. And when Judah woke up that morning, they saw an entire Assyrian army, this impregnable, formidable army, wiped out. Destroyed by one angel. What do you think God was trying to tell King Hezekiah? What do you think God was trying to tell you? What if he would have sent two? <laughs> he just sent one. Do you see what she means when she says that you have infinite power at your disposal? If one angel can wipe out an army that has never been defeated, what do you think God can do for you? If you just claim the promise, church. Just claim the promise. This story, this story as I'm closing now, this story, this story parallels the prophecy of what will happen to God's people in the last days. Let me just, just relate to you these parallels quickly as we wind this down. When, when the time of trouble came for Judah, only a remnant remained. The Bible says in Revelation that in the last days, only a remnant will remain. Judah was cut off from all earthly support. The Spirit of Prophecy tells us in the Desire of Ages that in the last great controversy, God's loyal people will be cut off from every earthly support. Satan unleashed a psychological attack on Judah saying you are all alone, God is not going to help you. You should just succumb. Spirit of Prophecy tells us that's exactly what he will do in the last days, that God's people will be under tremendous mental strain. The only weapon of war that King Hezekiah was left with was a weapon of prayer. And that is the only weapon that God's people will be left with during this crisis is the weapon of prayer. King Hezekiah had the promise that God would defeat their Syrians and God's people will have the promise that we will overcome the beast and overcome his image and overcome his mark and overcome the number of his name and stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. Now that is the promise. The question is, will we believe it? Will we cling to it? Will we hold to the promise because if God's people hold to the promise 
they cannot be defeated. Lastly, the king of Assyria, which we're talking about parallels now, the king of Assyria came down from the north to invade Judah. Prophecy tells us that God's people will be attacked by a king from the north. That's the papers. You'll find out in Daniel chapter 11, and verse 40. You see the parallels? Clear parallels all the way through to the end. God is telegraphing for you how, what God's people will experience in the last days. I do need to point something out to you, church. Hezekiah expected a crisis. He was prepared for the crisis, but he did not expect this kind of crisis. This crisis was much worse than he thought it would be. And his prayer prophecy tells us that's exactly what it would be for the people of God. Listen to this. It is often the case that trouble is greater in anticipation than in reality. But this is not true of the crisis before us. The most vivid presentation cannot reach the magnitude of the ordeal. In that time of trial, every soul must stand for himself before God. It will be much worse than we anticipate. This story parallels the crisis for God's people in the last days. We will suffer losses financially, socially, psychologically. God will allow these losses not because he wants us to suffer, but because he wants us to believe in his power, church. We can make all the physical preparations just like King Hezekiah did. I want you to get this point. We can make all the physical preparations. We can, we can move to the country. We can get out of debt. We can learn country living. But these physical preparations are only designed to ease the crisis. They are not what get you through the crisis. Let me read for you, as we close with these few quotes, what will get us through the crisis. Country living, is, country living is good. It is not designed to get you through the crisis. It is designed to ease the crisis. Listen to what gets you through the crisis. The only way, she says, this is the last day of advance, page 66. The only way in which man will be able to stand firm in the conflict is to be rooted and grounded in Christ. Amen. That's it. They must receive the truth as it is in Jesus. Now, you may have seen that phrase before. Let me tell you what she says, how she defines that phrase. The truth as it is in Jesus. Because it has to do with having an experience with God. That many of us today don't really have. Listen to this, how she describes this. The truth as it is in Jesus can be experienced, but never explained. Its height this is found in Desire of Ages, page 464. You need to write that down. Come back and look at this quote again. Desire of Ages, page 494. The truth as it is in Jesus can be experienced but never explained. Its height and breadth and depth pass our knowledge. We may task our imagination to the utmost and then we shall see only dimly the outlines of a love that is unexplainable that is as high as heaven, but that stooped down to the earth to stamp the image of God on all mankind. That's the truth as it is in Jesus. Great controversy, page 622. The time of trouble such as never was is soon to open upon us and we shall need, here's that word again, an experience which we do not now possess and which many are too indolent or lazy to obtain. Lord, help us. We need to have an experience with God. Hezekiah had enough of an experience with God that he remembered his one weapon of war that could defeat the Assyrian army. He remembered the prayer. And it saved him and all of Judah overnight. The question is, will we have this experience with Jesus? When the crisis comes, will the character that is revealed show that we have built 
a character like Christ right now. So when the crisis comes, his character is revealed. That's the question. Are we building the character now? Are we building an experience with Christ now? It takes time. And many of us are too lazy to do what is necessary to build this character. We are told that we are encompassed with so great a cloud of witnesses in Hebrews 12, 1, that we must lay aside every weight and the sin that doth so easily beset us. But I want to say one last quote as we close. Some of us may be caught up in a sin that we feel we can't get out of. Maybe you're struggling with something, and maybe you're even tempted to give up. Maybe you think that you're in such poor spiritual state, you're wondering how in the world is God going to get you ready for this crisis? How is God going to get you ready? This is taken from Heavenly Places, a short quote, but never forget it. We are not to be so overwhelmed with the thought of our sins and errors that we shall cease to pray. Amen. Why was she able to say that? Because you see, our God is merciful and long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. And he's going to do everything in his power to save us. You can be assured of that. Amen. All you have to do is cling to the promise. And remember that weapon that has fouled, filled armies, that has changed situations overnight. Don't listen to their words. God has you, and he will carry us to the very end. We can cling to that promise. Heads are bowed. Heads are bowed. We are praying as we're going to briefly open up the doors of the church, perhaps there is someone here who realizes that without God, they don't want to live without Him. You realize that you need a closer experience. You need a relationship with Him. Maybe you have never given your life to Him before. I don't know, but I want to give you an opportunity to do so now. Maybe you've never given your life to the Lord before, and maybe you want Bible studies. If there is anyone in here now, while the church is praying, just raise your hand. 